Alright, good morning everyone. Can you hear me uh, even in the back middle tonight? Uh, so I want to jump right in. Um, and by way of introduction, I'm just going to take care of that. So I'm uh, Tom Lowerman. I'm from the Penn State School of Visual Arts. And I'm really happy also to introduce Jonathan Keep, who is here from Suffolk in the UK, uh, originally from South Africa. And uh, the purpose of the talk uh, is to look at computation, clay, and culture. And so it encompasses uh, 3D design, uh, thinking about how you work with new technologies and align them with traditional means of working in ceramics. Uh, we'll talk a bit about 3D printing, uh, but also really talk about how you generate an idea, how you work through that idea, and how you incorporate all kinds of tools uh, along the way. And as Jonathan and I started thinking about doing this presentation, really the core of it was to think about not how do you work with some of these tools, to be less about sort of uh, a, a technical presentation, but really to take a moment and think about why would you use some of these processes? Why would you get involved in coding, for instance? Why would you want to get involved uh, in a process that might pull your hand a little bit further away from the work? Why would you want to uh, look at all kinds of design softwares that, after all, might be um, focused on other fields uh, than art and, and incorporate those into your own work. And so uh, Jonathan Keep uh, has been really uh, at the forefront of developing uh, especially sort of DIY and open source ways of working with uh, computation and clay. And it was his uh, uh, sort of publication of an open source uh, 3D printing tool uh, that really got me interested in this uh, subject several years ago. And over the last couple of years, we've struck up a correspondence. Uh, and that went very quickly from me asking technical questions to me trying to find out more about Jonathan's working process and his ethos and his uh, uh, interests as an artist. And so uh, without any further ado then, uh, maybe we'll go ahead and uh, move along to the first uh, slide. And just before you start, Jonathan, I wanted to say that we came up with a few questions uh, as a prompt to kind of talk about uh, these topics. So go ahead, yeah. Johnny. So the, the structure of this talk is um, we've got kind of five questions we've asked ourselves, and we'll then try and both answer those. Uh, and this has come out a little of people writing to me, writing to Tom in that, um, and uh, we respond, um, and this is our kind of summary. Uh, so very often the question that comes to me is, and you know, as on the screen, you know, why would you want to use computers? Um, on the whole, people want to go into ceramics to use their hands, to actually play with the material, and so on and so forth. Um, and that's absolutely fine. I've been potting for good on kind of 40 years or so. Um, so it's been a development all the time. Uh, and um, as Thomas said, uh, you know, I have this reputation as someone who builds machines and, and so on and so forth. But it's really, really nice to actually be t talk about why I got to that situation, and I got to that situation because I got interested in what you could do on computers. Um, so about 18 years ago, I got the chance to uh, um, do a project around um, new media and, and uh, using computation. Um, and what absolutely struck me is I, within my ceramics, I'm the kind of person who's interested in form rather than surface. So that was the first thing. And then further to that, that South African experience I had, my kind of worldview is one of ecology uh, and evolution. Um, and so looking at that, any f natural form, the relationship between art and nature, any um, natural form, there is a code, a genetic code, a system that has, that form has grown out of. Uh, and computerization sort of started to offer me a way to explore that, that digital techniques you could start growing forms in computer. Um, so this is my iceberg series. Tom, sorry, if you wouldn't mind getting back. Right, really. Are we running late already? No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> That's right. Um, uh, so the iceberg series, obviously the content of the work, I'm um, using the iceberg as a you know, representation of kind of ecological um, situation and how we're treating our planet and so on and so forth. So that's the content that I'm working with. Um, but these forms have been generated 
um, in computer code on the left hand side. So I use something called processing that um, is a Java code. Quite often your computer has to update its Java. That's the code I'm, I'm, or language that I'm working in. Uh, processing is an open source um, sort of format. So all the software I use is, is open source. And so in teaching, I can very easily just pass that on to other people. So in this slide on the left-hand side is the code that is written. Uh, and then down the middle is a visualization that the processing um, package offers you. And you can see that um, uh, sort of chicken wire mesh thing. Uh, and then on the right-hand side is the physical object that comes out of that. Um, and I'm really kind of the whole time intrigued how w you, know, you work in this very abstract manner uh, in the code, but it is the physicality of the object at the end of it, its clayness and all that sort of stuff that I've worked in for 40 years that really kind of is the driving point behind that. Now these pieces are generated out of something called Perlin noise. So in actual fact, this is a cylinder. So I, I have to say the thinking behind all this is of a kind of a potter. I've got this cylinder. If you were throwing on the pottery wheel, it would be your fingers that are slowly kind of um, forming that piece on the wheel. Here what is happening is the mathematical function of a pearl and noise is just shaping that. So in the computation, you know, as that mesh generates inside the virtual space, um, it, uh, from the bottom layer, it would pull out sideways like you might with your hand, but it also, because of the power of the computation, has the, bo the possibility to do it in three dimensions. So it isn't pulling it in many more directions than you could with using the tool that is the pottery wheel. So that's the essence of that, and if we could go on to the next. Um, this shot is obviously looking down inside one of those things. And here what I want to make the point is that um, the content and the process and the material, I, you know, within my work, I want it to come together. So the content is about the iceberg and so on and so forth. So I'm using the translucency of the porcelain material to enhance that, okay? The process of the ceramic 3D printing is one of layering that again is reinforcing that natural phenomena of the way that ice is layered. And the pearl and noise then Mr. Perlin is the mathematician who worked out that, and it's, a, it's actually a, a function that uses a lot of chance and randomness to it, um, is also what they use for generating kind of computer game landscapes and things like that. So what intrigues me there, and this the interest in the art and nature, is how us humans can classify natural phenomena and that, in this case, is the way that ice deteriorates or ice melts or landscapes you know, erode, that the pearl and noise kind of comes to mimic that. One of the things that I think is really um, a, a tremendous opportunity if you're going to work with computation, if you're going to work with digital fabrication and, and 3D printing, is that you have the ability uh, as an artist to work with uh, people in all kinds of different disciplines. And so one of the things you have to decide right off the bat is sort of how you're going to generate a form. And there are many, many options for that. And so there are solutions that have been made for architects, other solutions for uh, jewelry designers or en engineers, or as Jonathan is doing, uh, you know, adapting a coding solution to an artistic uh, endeavor. And that not, not only allows you a lot of different pathways uh, and tool sets to work with, but it also opens up uh, really interesting possibilities for collaboration uh, between these different areas and communication between these different areas. And since uh, Jonathan mentioned the mathematician, I'll, I'll, I'll mention a, a mathematician I've become interested in is a, a guy uh, named George Boole. Uh, and from him comes uh, Boolean algebra, and from Boolean algebra comes something like a Boolean operation, which this is a very simple one here a sphere and a square, and a cube rather, and you see that these can be unioned, or one can be subtracted from the other, or you can just take the area uh, in which they overlap. And that seems fairly simple, but what I think is so interesting about a lot of these tools that you find in a computing environment is that they don't mimic necessarily real world tools. So it's hard for me to go into a studio and subtract one object from another object, or take two objects and only the areas where they intersect. And this is also uh, Boolean algebra, what allows uh, something like a Google search uh, to work very well. So that if I search Jonathan, I get a lot of results. Or if I search Keep, I get different results. 
if I search Jonathan Keep, I might find you. Um, and so Jonathan will talk more about using the technology of our age. But I think that there's something that's really interesting about um, you know, applying these tools, which are used across many segments of society uh, as in an artistic process. And another thing that I think is really good is this possibility of uh, working, at least at the beginning stages, at the drawing stages of a project, without gravity, uh, without all the difficulties of material, and working with great complexity so that there's a, a level of planning uh, that can happen. And this is a wireframe mesh in the open source Blender software. Uh, and that you can work without scale and you can um, do, uh, have a great degree of freedom in the design and then take on this really wonderful challenge of sort of how to uh, then move that from the screen to somewhere else. It also creates a possibility to take models that others in other fields have made. You know, perhaps you want to look at something, um, work with someone who does physics simulations, or really look at how water moves or how an object is uh, changed by a force that's exerted on it, and that you could take uh, a modeling simulation coming from just about any field of study and at some point freeze that and convert it into some sort of an object. And so <clears throat> the last thing I'll say on this topic is that I'm really interested at this particular intersection where objects enter and exit the computer. Uh, and so it's a two-way street. We can begin uh, on a screen-based uh, coding or uh, modeling platform, or we can begin by scanning and getting objects into the computer. And I think having something exit the computation space or have it, having it enter can be very awkward. There can be a lot of distortion that happens in that process. And again, I think that represents a possibility. Uh, the idea that it won't necessarily be a, a perfect uh, rendering that this scanner makes, but you can then use the, uh, uh, you know, the difficulties of that in the process. <clears throat> I also want to mention, uh, this is uh, Rob Lugo. I think this is just a great example. I like to show that the object on view here on the right uh, does involve some objects that were made through a scanning process and an elaborate uh, milling process and eventually a casting process, which was then incorporated with who knows how many other processes, wheel throwing and luster firing and glazing. And that um, I really want to stress that we both have come to find that you know, a lot of these processes we see as an extension of and ad an addition to an existing tool set uh, rather than trying to sort of um, throw out one way of working and, and work in an entirely different way. In my own work, I'm very interested in complex shapes that, that are very precise, that may nest together. Um, so in the small image here, you see these all together. Uh, and in the larger image, they're all sort of separated apart. And I do love the amount of control uh, some of these processes allow for um, that type of uh, precision working. Ken, Tom has been talking about collaboration and ways of working, and I think those are really two important parts. And I place a lot of emphasis, you know, I, I continually talk about way of working. Um, and uh, so uh, in the slide, this is actually a collaboration between um, Unfold uh, and a fellow glass blower, Charlie Stern. So um, the couple in, in the top picture there is um, the guys who really kind of first cracked the uh, extrusion 3D printing, uh, live in Am Antwerp in Belgium. Um, and I, you know, visited them, befriended them, and I copied their system. Um, but uh, what, you know, by working digitally, you start having a platform that is so much easier to then work, in this case, with, with other art forms. Um, that uh, I think too often, working within ceramics, we tend to get ghettoized because we sort of concentrate on this material rather than the ways of working and the ideas that you can work with. Uh, so the glass project, the transaction project, was about exploring computational working with clay and ceramic. So we were 3D printing ceramic and the final outcome was blown objects into that uh, over on is right. your, your right hand side. Um, uh, that was a workshop um, uh, in Denmark where uh, the, the art school had a sound department and a 3D department and for a, wo a week we tried to go between sound over to 3D representing sound in 3D and then taking that 3D and then taking it back into representing sound. And how else could you explore these things but through the commonality of, of the computation or computer? Um, 
And then this is the other side of it, you know, obviously uh, this is my interest, but in between art and science. Um, but similarly, I collaborate with this um, guy, Enrico Cohen, who is a um, evolutionary bi biologist, uh, and he theorized, uh, well, he works around the theories of how cells divide, and then how cells slowly generate form out of that. So, you know, from a sculptural aspect, I said, hey, you know, that's kind of where, where I'm thinking. Can I use your software? So I can then use his software to generate form. So you s literally start with a, a cell and you give it properties and you let that run and actually see what develops out of that, you know, very process based. So the next question was, is the use of computing going to take over from the traditional ways of working of clay? We were just, you know, looking for questions that people have that, that point to um, maybe, you know, anxious uh, feelings that, that, that one might have about uh, engaging with some of these processes. Right, so kind of the question I'd ask at this point is who's been throwing for 40 years? Exactly, there's a group of us. I, it, it just kind of irks me a little bit so that so often pottery is about throwing, you know, and that's absolutely fine, I can do all that. But this, you know, the way we're working is an add-on to that. As far as I'm concerned, it's not going to, you know, take over at all. As Tom has already alluded in work, it's, it's about just adding on and it's more processes that we can do. You know, that is problematic is how you cover all of this. But then uh, currently, you tend to get people who say hand build or throw or, and in time it'll be work digitally. Um, so uh, in a piece like this, um, because I'm really interested in form, in actual fact, you know, my argument is that the pottery wheel um, has been detrimental to the development of ceramic form, is because as a machine, it is very limiting in that it's always producing these sort of round, symmetrical objects. Um, and here now we have a tool set, I don't like the word tool set, but that's what it is, um, that goes back to computer-guided coil building. And so I can start to explore the kind of forms that really interest me, historical forms, that were very often coil built, that offer you so much more opportunity. So in a piece like this, like this, uh, the, the seed beds, I'm writing a little piece of code, and that's got about eight parameters to it. Um, I can then move the parameters, capture that file, move the parameters, capture the next one. So, you know, in within the content here, where I'm thinking of this is top left is the original piece. I can then generate the form going across right-handed. I can then generate the form coming down from that. And then inevitably on the diagonal, you get the complexity. So at one level, that's kind of quite a formal thing. But within artistic expression, you could start to see the analogy with, say, a thought or an idea, how it will develop in one direction and the other and not surprising you then get the complexity of the other direction or you could think of your own lifespan top left and how over a period of time experiences are building building and then you end up with this the complexity that is your life now in the bottom left hand corner talking about tradition these pieces are a combination obviously of, of glass and ceramic so what I'm doing here is I am 3D printing a waste mold that the glass blows blow into to give me the glass form, um, and then printing in porcelain the form to go into that. Um, so I'm coming from this, you know, 40-year ceramic background of, you know, this, the, I, I treat the vessel as a sculptural object. I have done, you know, utilitarian domestic wear, but my really my interest is to use you know, the pot form as a, a, you know, a, an artistic expression. And here I'm still thinking like the potter, there's the glaze on the outside, there's the body in the, on the inside, but I now have the tool set, I'm using it again, that I can pattern the surface with the quality of light that has then been refracted between the glass and the body. Um, Sound surface series is in, in some ways, again, that sort of traditional potter in me. I'm taking a pixel and I'm spiraling it in virtual space, thinking like somebody coil building. And then as that's coil building in the vertical, slowly building up, I'm adding the sound quality to that. So, you know, in a straight line, you get the sound wave. That has now been put on as it's coil building. 
So you're getting the quality of the sound put on the, to the, uh, the surface of the piece. I'm decorating with sound. One of the things we wanted to do with this talk was look around at complaints or, or concerns or, or sort of, uh, you know, things people had voiced about, you know, what, what might be really tricky or, or complex in, in handling uh, some of these tools. And so this was a comment I found on a forum that I thought was interesting. The, the person wrote, I suspect that the first really worthwhile 3D printed ceramic art won't be made by people with a lifetime of experience in molds or wheel throwing or carving, but by people with ideas formed doing digital modeling. And to some extent, uh, I would disagree, of course. I think there's, at this conference, we've seen uh, an, an incredible range of uh, uh, 3D printed form uh, made within this field uh, uh, that, that kind of counters that point. But at the same time, uh, these processes do allow people uh, from kind of all kinds of different fields without necessarily tremendous uh, previous experience in clay uh, to get engaged with the material in a way that is perhaps a little bit different. And so here uh, you see uh, an artist doing an installation where not only the uh, installation itself, but the tool that, that makes it is included. Um, emerging ar objects, uh, here uh, an architecture um, approach to this and scaling up. Uh, one of the things that I think is really exciting about this, all of this way of working is that uh, the collaborative potential and also the potential for this to go in directions that um, perhaps extend a bit beyond uh, what we're accustomed to in the field of ceramics. And also, uh, Takeem Lee coming from a background in graphic design and Unfold, as you've mentioned prior, uh, a design firm uh, working with this. <clears throat> also, that innovation in this space happens all over the place. So as somebody interested in computation and clay and digital fabrication and 3D printing, you have to kind of keep an eye on what's going on in other fields. And this is uh, uh, scientific research at the University of Missouri just to develop a uh, printable support material that can then be dissolved and removed from the object, which is a tremendous innovation that might allow artists to do all kinds of um, type of crea creation of form that presently uh, can't do with this process. And so here we, within the conference, we're talking about clay and culture and specifically our question here is about tradition and I'm just really intrigued, I'm, I'm linked with, with Wasp, is Massimo in the middle of this photograph, he has no clay background, but he has this vision that he wants to be able to build relief housing with clay, with a really big ceramic 3D printer. Um, and uh, how he will have transformed the clay culture from outside of clay and not from within clay in a very conscious sort of way that I guess a lot of ceramic people think about it. So the next question is, what about the hand of the artist in all of this? And I referred to a text by Catherine Scott that's really wonderful uh, called The Honesty of Extrusion. And the, the subject of this is how technological tools are marketed to us versus how they are in reality. And so any of you uh, working with some of these tools recognize that there's sort of like a hype cycle that, that gets us uh, you know, really, really inspired about um, how some of these tools may work. And then when you have your hands on the tool, you sort of recognize it has all kinds of constraints, just as any other studio process would. In fact, it may have really significant constraints that other uh, studio processes do not. And so what I liked about this text was that she talks about the difference between an impossible aesthetic, what is sort of marketed to us, and the aesthetic of extrusion, the, the, the way that things come out of these machines, and her choice to sort of prefer the latter, uh, to sort of uh, think, let's embrace the difficulty, let's embrace the, uh, uh, the, the sort of process of this and, and, and maybe put aside the impossible aesthetic, the, the, the notion that you can form this uh, object in a virtual space and hit play and it will emerge. Uh, maybe we should get rid of that way of thinking. And then beyond that, one of the things that's really wonderful about a lot of these tools and processes is that they haven't been developed so much by major players in industry, uh, the printing in clay. Uh, a lot of it is being done in a kind of DIY grassroots way. And as a result of that, you have drastically different approaches. So uh, obviously on the left and right here, you have very, very different scales of extrusion, probably also very different clay bodies, but in both cases, uh, we're working with clay here. And so personal choices that an artist or designer or engineer makes have a tremendous reflection in the artwork that's created. 
And that, those choices begin, of course, with what it is you want to begin to make, but also the choices you make in terms of software, in terms of whether you're coding or whether you're doing something in a visual environment, and then decisions about how you make the tool. Uh, and so in this image, you see uh, on the left uh, a printing uh, tool that I've developed, and on the right a printing tool that Jonathan has developed, and they share a lot of uh, similar ideas, and we share a lot of ideas about how these things might emerge. But as we've gotten to know each other, we realize we're trying to make very different objects. So of course, the tools should be very different, just as when you move from one studio to another, uh, you're not all using the exact same potter's wheel. We're not all using the exact same hand tools. And so I think it's a, a really fantastic thing in a way that there hasn't been more support for looking at clay as a medium for these tools, because had there been, maybe there would be a lot more homogenization in this process. And just as a way of talking about that experimentation, this slide is simply all parts that we've used in our printer uh, process at some point and since discarded. So there's quite a lot of sort of trial and error that happens with that. And I would say briefly that in my own work, uh, I'm working more sculpturally. And so uh, as Jonathan has been visiting all this week, uh, commenting he's never seen so much infill in his life, a technical term. But um, the idea that I want to use a gritty terracotta clay. I want to make a thing that has a little bit of a more of the feel of a brick than it does a pot. And therefore, the design choices are going to be different from the software to the tool to the process to the material and ultimately the printed form. Okay, so th I mean, this question has been about what's happened to the hand, um, and uh, this slide I'm putting up in that it was the first time that I started working in, um, in, in new techniques, uh, and in this case it was to do a, a CD-ROM, but in 1999, I'm just putting a, a date to this, so, so uh, I spent six months working in virtual reality, and being that physical studio-based person, I was left thinking, you know, kind of what about the hand and all of this. Uh, and I absolutely appreciate, you know, I listen to a lot of music and it's the hand on the keys of the piano and the, and the sensitivity of that. And I'm left thinking, God, what's, what is actually happening here? Um, and uh, so thinking that through, I've been left thinking, ah, uh, actually the hand has been hijacked. We, we've kind of romanticized this whole hand thing. Sorry, I'm holding my hands out. Um, a bit of a kind of Marxist reading, but if you just think how commerce has taken over on the hand, uh, uh, there was a television program I saw recently in Ikea who is mass producing vases. Out in uh, China, they are asking the workers as they take the vase out of the mold to just squish it a little bit so that when it goes to the store, the, um, c uh, the customer will get a sense of the hand of the maker. And you just think by, that, by the time that's ha um, happening, we need to reassess that apparent sensitivity of the hand. If you think of the gallery system and how you now have these big studios, produ you know, sort of almost um, factories producing work at the high end. But now this is all about the sensitivity of the individual artist and their hand. You know, kind of what's going on within marketing. I think we've got to also think about, again, a rather kind of um, post-colonial reading of all of this is that we live in a very privileged society and we might be able to kind of think about throwing on the wheel but as a therapy for ourselves you know and then the you know the fun of using your hands um, but uh, in a developing country they would love to be able to mechanize and actually have machines to do things that you know we would prefer to and and the hand actually represents exploitation a lot of the time in in these situations so um, ultimately, I think we need to start thinking about not necessarily the hand, but it's the sensitivity to, of the artist to how we actually use all of this. You know, it's the ideas that go into that and then, you know, how you manipulate it, those ways of working. So here my way of working is in a very random manner. These are randomly grown pieces. And what I'm trying to do in some ways is actually get back, you know, take the ego of the artist out of the piece, getting back to the process, and you know, this is my interest in art and nature, is that the code is a natural phenomena, the material is happening there, and if you are seeing figures, thanks Tom, the next one, oh yeah, or dancers in these pieces, that is, it's because we as human beings you know, and this is kind of interest in, in evolutionary psychology, want to recognize the world in our own image. So by kind of using a very objective manner, that's all right, Tom, 
um, I can start to actually connect with my viewer. And that's that sensitivity I'm talking about. Um, and this is more recent work that I'm doing, and this is, uh, you know, obviously I'm using VR, virtual reality tools, but I want to call it more AR, augmented reality. Um, and this is about still working in a much more bodily fashion. Uh, and a piece like this is, you know, drawn like that, and I'm standing, I'm standing inside it when I'm working on the piece. But then I can scale it down and print it as a tiny little object or print it to real size. The next question was, what are the negatives or obstacles to combining computation and clay? So one of the readings I see a lot is that there's no real kind of industry driving this. Um, so there hasn't been a lot of resource put into it, say in comparison to, say, metal 3D printing, you know, the aeronautics and so on and so forth. Um, and, uh, you know, the jury is, in, in my, uh, uh, my view anyway, from where I'm staying, is out as to kind of which of these processes one should be going with. So there's powder printing, you know, the Z Corps machines, um, then there's the, what I'm calling slip sintering, and there's a machine out in, in France that is using a laser and sintering the slip, and then there's, you know, the Form 2 lab in Porcelight over, um, you know, coming out of the States here, and then the clay extrusion that, we're, that a lot of us are using as well. You know, I think ultimately it's, I mean, in British terms, is horses for courses. Mm -hmm. It depends what you want to do. All of these have their strengths and weaknesses. Um, this slide, uh, I was asked to collaborate with this PhD student down at um, uh, the, the Leach Pottery. And so Matthew, as part of his project, he had redesigned the throne range um, for the Leach Pottery, but he had done it on a CAD program. And the takeaway I want to take from here is that use the right tool for the right job. He then had CAD files. I could try and print those. And they were a bugger to, you know, relative, a bugger to print. I can throw. I should just jump on the pottery wheel and throw it. So, you know, you don't want to come to it, although, you know, I've been saying I've got this mindset of a traditional potter, but I'd like to think that's in a formal sense uh, and not in a practical sense. Don't just imitate what is practical pottery over into the, you know, the pottery machine in some ways. It's you've got a whole new option of ways of working. Um, and then this slide, we run up against a problem of software quite a lot of the time. You know, that software is improving all the time, um, but the slicer, that's the, you know, the bit of software that prepares the often file for printing. You know, there are problems with that. It doesn't like crossing over quite often. So, you know, having the ability to actually, you know, I would call it simplify my tool set, and that's I work at this level of code, I can just code it, and I'm thinking like the printer, right, okay, you drawing a path like this, and I just code straight onto a file that then goes straight to the machine. You know, so my sort of thinking process is drawing these curves. Well, obviously a mathematical formula is drawing the curves, but I'm just, uh, for those people who kind of know their techie stuff, I'm generating the G-code straight out of code. Another thing uh, that I wanted to do as a way, a different way of answering this question, what are the obstacles, was to solicit, uh, you know, friends and, uh, who, who've worked with some of these tools and looked at them and, and, and what some of the other uh, perceptions are. And so this was a, a bit of a quote uh, saying that there's a bit of a privilege issue with who has access to printers. I imagine the overall demographic for 3D printer users in the U.S. skews horrifically into the upper white male middle uh, corner of whatever graph you'd care to plot it on. And I want to address uh, that concern and, and, and other concerns as well, um, that if we're working with technological tools, I do think it's one of the roles we have as artists to question them. And after all, I, in, in collaboration um, with people in other fields, I'm not sure that industry has as much of an invested role in sort of questioning the technology and the ethics of it, so much as it's just advancing the technology. And so one effort uh, that I was thrilled to be a part of was this uh, 3D Additivist Cookbook, which is a free uh, sort of downloadable open source collection of artists working with digital fabrication and 3D printing specifically. And not so much that they're using it in their work, but that they would make work that is also in a way a commentary on those tools and the difficulties of using them and also the difficulties of obtaining them, the difficulties of maintaining them and the difficulties of um, feeling sympathetic with some of these tools. 
<clears throat> and so an example of one of the projects in there is this one by Laura Devendorf uh, called Anatomy of a Cyborg 3D Printer. And she mentioned that she was interested in how she might misuse these machines to work in a more open-ended way. And she felt that when she started using some of these softwares and some of these tools that they were designed for someone else. You know, maybe you've had that experience of sort of, you know, opening up a software package and feeling like, God, nobody was thinking about me when they designed this thing. They were thinking about uh, uh, perhaps somebody in a whole other field of, of study. And that can be intimidating and also off-putting. And so this is a humorous take, but in, but in this, you know, she sort of wants to make herself uh, the, the machine herself. And, and she talks about contrasting feminized work with machines which tend to be associated with masculinity and could provoke questions. And so how do you address that? Well, um, it, it's tricky, but one of the ways we could start to kind of deal with the uh, question of access to tools would be to work uh, in an open source fashion. And so uh, Jonathan's printer is here on the left. A print head that I've been using for some time is on the right. And these are uh, designs that can be downloaded and built. Actually, I'm sure many of you in the audience have built Jonathan's uh, printer design. And so having shared that as an open source tool, it really, really lowers uh, the barriers to access. It also gives you that tremendous sense that I built this tool, and when it breaks, because it will break, um, I can fix it. And another thing that Jonathan and Dries uh, 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 initiated was this wonderful uh, forum, and I'm sure there are others as well, uh, but that was really focused on you know, building your own tool for uh, 3D printing and ceramic. And the other day, I made a little survey and just asked people who used the forum what their field of, uh, pro or what their profession was or their field of study. And to our surprise, uh, the largest group was engineers and material scientists. Um, artists and craftspeople were the second largest group, but designers were very close, and then there was a small scattering of, of sort of, you know, other, other folks in there. And what that really pointed out is that all these different groups of people have a really in, a, a great vested interest in working with ceramics, and I think that that's really fascinating, and probably not to make artworks. I'm not sure what their aim is, but it's, it, it's really uh, kind of in a very organic way. This has become a very um, uh, collaborative space. So the, the last question here is, how do you think these new ways of working should be learned and taught? Okay, so um, this slide represents a project I've been involved in for now five years in Europe. So it's an EU-funded thing. Um, looking at how 3D printing, and this is not just clay printing, will be uh, implemented into s to schools from you know, early years up to high school. Um, and uh, this is now coming to the end of its five-year cycle. And, um, what I take away from this is not so much the problems of the output, um, that in fact the machines are kind of there. You know, they're not easy to use, but they, they are, you know, are they. It's actually the generation of the content that gets given to the machines that it's all about. So, I, you know, I absolutely make the emphasis the whole time that if you're involved in teaching, Start from the point of the generation of the idea and how you're going to use the tool set to get there. Um, too often people see the, you know, the machine whizzing around, they say, I want one of those. You know. And there must be, from that um, Google group, literally hundreds of machines out there looking for something to do <laughs> is because it was chicken and egg, it was the wrong way around. Um, you know, what was really, sorry, Tom, if we just go back, uh, down the bottom, uh, as I say, this project was um, 3D printing in general, but clay is really kind of winning out within the schools because of, you know, all sorts of things, but, and uh, Tom will talk about those. Uh, this is, um, I teach a, a block down at, um, in, uh, uh, um, uh, down in Limoges, and interesting here, this course is a cross-discipline course, so we kind of have designers, fine arts, uh, fine arts, and more kind of makers on the course. I, I think a lot of, the, you know, the more emphasis on this way of working is probably at almost um, a postgraduate degree. Um, you know, I absolutely appreciate that early years in a ceramic course, there is a lot to do. You know, if you can't fire a kiln, there's not much point making an object in, in you know, on a 3D print in the first place. So you've just got to kind of b build up these techniques through the education system. At the moment, the, you know, the learning curve is quite heavy for a lot of us because we have no background. But I think, you know, as illustrated in these slides, 
once we get school, you know, uh, students coming through from school who are, com you know, very computer literate, then the whole kind of level of education needs to change a little bit. Um, and so these are just various places that I've worked. Um, so uh, top left was Iceland, and re really interesting that course. I've been out there to do, you know, two modules. Um, in t over two periods, we've only had one male on the course. So um, you know, Tom spoke about the gender divide and that, and you know, it's something one has to be very aware of. But I think what is interesting is that you know we talk about accessibility. Is once the kit is on the ground, I think that whole gender problem, you know. It's not uncommon that the men are hanging around the machines. When I do workshops, you know, often I say, okay, what software are you using? And you get guys putting up their hands, I use Studio Max, this, that, and the other, you know, high-end software. And I say, no, 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 let's all just calm down. Just use Tinkercad, you know, the most basic software there is, and I want to see what your creativity is to get out of that. And then, you know, that whole data divide just flattens, you know, I, it comes down to, how you use this tool set and, and what you've got inside of yourself. Um, I, we've been talking, sorry, uh, sorry I, I just want to go there. We are running out of time. But uh, we tend to also think a lot about 3D printing, where I think the whole kind of 3D milling for mold making uh, is something that needs to be kind of streamed into more university education. Um, it, this is out in Estonia, the, the bottom shot with, with the robot arm. I think that's also, as robot arms become more controllable within a class, uh, classroom situation, I think we could well be going away from 3D printers and more into arms, because obviously you can mill with an arm and you can print with an arm. Um, and then actually, Tom has gone through this a little bit right at the beginning, but it's, it's how you can generate content, of which scanning is one of those. And I, w w as I travel around, I'm forever asking people, how are you doing your scanning? I don't think there's one really good way yet, but it's getting, you know, that technology is getting there all the time. So one, wa one thing I wanted to say about is how, how these tools can be taught. Um, I, I tried to make a bit of a map of how I think I work, and it involves uh, clay and drawing and teaching and sculpture and digital fabrication and designing the machine and CAD. And then in the green here are things that I can't do, but I love to collaborate with people who can do interactive art, physical computing, coding, engineering and material science, architecture, and in the orange here are things that I'm not involved with but that are just always in my periphery. Animation, game design, pottery, client-directed work, art criticism, curation. And what I mean by showing all this is just that I think it's really important if you're interested in any of these tools to kind of keep tabs on what people in adjacent fields are doing or even more far-flung fields. And I've found that um, it's been a tremendous asset in teaching some of these processes to have a classroom that has perhaps a third of the student body are design students, perhaps another third are engineering students, and the last third being our sort of more familiar art students. And that having a diverse group like that allows one group that's particularly good at working with their hands to speak with another group that may not be, but might be particularly good at doing animation or doing uh, computer modeling. The other thing that I wanted to say that Jonathan alluded to briefly was um, I, a part of me uh, is really concerned about the fact that when we think of 3D printing in education, we sort of default to plastic. And I know this is a grisly image for the morning, uh, but I'm, I'm really not interested in supporting uh, what I would call a plastic economy and, and sort of the idea that that has, why has that become the default material for this? After all, it's a partial combustion of the material that's taking place in all of these classrooms. It's not necessarily uh, a, a, a healthy uh, thing to work with. And also I found that the objects themselves are, can be very lightweight and very unsatisfactory in a way. That sometimes the students at the end of the semester leave the plastic objects on the shelves. I just find that they don't do that as often with the clay objects. Um, another thing uh, that makes me wish we could go back in time and talk to someone in the 3D printing industry and and start the whole thing over is a comparison of costs. And so at the very left here, you see uh, the cost to print a cube that's 100 millimeters uh, in dry clay. And then we all think of porcelain as a very expensive material. It's three times as much as the dry clay, but it's, as you can see here, uh, 100 times less cost than some of the more uh, exotic materials that are sort of being marketed to us. And so those materials can't be used in an end-use product necessarily if they're plastics. Um, they don't really scale up very well at all. 
and you can't work with them much after they have been printed. So granted, it may be a, a bit more complexity in the machine and the process to work with clay, but I think it was a mistake uh, to rush into uh, plastic as the default, and I would like to uh, you know, make the case as much as we can uh, that outside of uh, the field of art, that a as a 3D printing tool, there may be a tremendous advantage to uh, looking at clay uh, across many disciplines. <clears throat> so finally, we'll wrap up, and um, as we would welcome absolutely any questions uh, about the topics covered, um, and I think I'm just going to leave it there. So thank you all. Yeah. So I just. <clears throat> You know, I really want to make a point. We've always got 15 minutes. I think it's a, an interesting time to have discussion. Um, questions? Yeah, I have a, uh, it was a great presentation. So much to take in. Well, well done. I'm just curious. We often, I was thinking back historically, and, you know, you decide to have your uh, hand-building class and you have your throwing class, and we tend to s section things off in terms of how things are made. And... Uh, it seems like there's more interest in what's in between things or more idea oriented. And do you think looking ahead that there would be like a course on dissonance or so you could see people actually incorporating ideas and self-expression and then thinking, you know, what technique might facilitate those ideas? And uh, it's, it's one of my favorite assignments is ask students to throw a cup, but then alter the cup to such a degree that you can never tell it was thrown. And it's a surprisingly hard for students to do that. And I would, I would imagine it's the same thing with the, you know, 3D printing. If you print an object, could you alter that object to such a degree that no one could tell it right. was 3D printed? Right. You want to take that? <laughs> I always say I'm a kind of reflective thinker that, <laughs> um, you know, I'm not a particularly reactive thinker and things like this going. Um, uh, this isn't necessarily going to be the answer for that, but I have to say that you know my experience is that so often students see three D prints going wrong, and then they say, "Hey, isn't that just fantastic?" And I'm sorry, I'm just dead tired of it. I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, you probably got got it a little bit from me. I'm much more interested in the generation side, and uh, you know the point there is I would want to go back into the software, and what is interesting is in a, that virtual. Um, so, you know, uh, virtual world, whatever, however you're manipulating that, you can do such amazing things with form. That, and I think that, you know, that you w y it's going down the same direction there, that um, is a student can come up with a form you know, on screen, and then you can start getting them to question that form and you know, moving that th through iterations and so on and so forth. Uh, and then that becomes, you know, a physical object in due course. Um, but that same mindset can be worked through on screen, you know, better, I don't know, but equally at least. Yeah. I think uh, the question, Chris, is a really fascinating one. And one of the things that we've seen uh, is that there's a particular type of surface that's generated with this process. And I think anyone who's worked with this process immediately is intrigued and, and seduced by that surface. Oh, look at those tiny little delicate lines that are in there. That's so fascinating. And so I think there's uh, an approach that could be to leave the tooling mark in, just as there is an approach to any clay work where you're leaving the tooling mark in. And I think there is also a tremendous approach uh, or, or potential for a hybrid approach. And I do think it's one of the great advantages of this material in this process is that yes, you could take the thing off of the platform and you could cut it and you could reassemble it. You could add something that was hand built or wheel thrown. It's just regular old studio clay that uh, most of us are using in this process. It's no special material. And so I do feel that um, maybe getting aside from ceramic students, I've found that if it's a student of engineering who knows a great deal of, about 3D printing, they might be very accustomed to the idea that the thing rolls off the printer and it's it either worked or it didn't work. It's kind of a binary. Um, but that if it was made out of clay, uh, the ceramic students I've worked with who've played around with these tools are so much more willing to say, you know what, it got about 80% where I wanted it to. But that's fine. That's fine. I'm going to go in now. I'm going to go in there with my hands. I'm going to get that back to where I wanted it to be. And so I, I think that has been eye-opening for some of the students who aren't accustomed to 
how you fix a thing that's only 80% of what it was supposed to be, because uh, there was the set up this sort of binary uh, approach to working. <coughs> <laughs> So Could you use the mic, Chris? I'm sorry. That, that, that sense of process, or even if you, 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 know, you 3D printed an object and then you or were interested in this idea of time or erosion, and you could sort of sandblast that object. Sure. So all of a sudden, you're taking a whole sort of phenomenon of the wind hitting the stone, and, and again, it becomes something that, that seems to transcend the process and becomes more about the person. And I'm not saying that one can't do I'm just saying it's just one, another option that could be introduced, and it does. It seems like our education limits those options in some way. Mm -hmm. it, it's something to think about. As Jonathan pointed out, I, I think you know I, I'd like to reflect on that idea. Um, one of the things that I would encourage anyone interested in these processes, and we've talked about this a lot this week, is that, and I, I'll take something you told me. Jonathan made his design open source thinking for most everyone it would be a starting point. And, and, in, and in fact, maybe many people read it as uh, this is how you build the machine. Uh, this is the rules. You, you make it this way and then it runs this way. And so, and, and you could apply that also to how you interact with software, how you interact with material, anywhere along the way. I think if these tools are going to be useful for all of us, we have to develop a million different ways of working with them, just as you see out here with every process that's out there. And so part of that, I think, is redesigning the machine, you know, asking for it to do different things. And so that, um, <clears throat> you know, you, you would, someone would maybe want to work on a tremendously large scale with a really gritty material. Someone else might want to go the opposite direction with that. And so I hope that a, a, a sort of wave of homogenization uh, isn't something that we see with the introduction of a new technology. And it's difficult because I think software tools in particular are geared towards solving problems. And a lot of us aren't problem solvers per se. We, in a certain way, create problems um, and explore problems or, uh, as Graham Sullivan would say, surround problems. And so I think we have to think of the tool and we have to think of the processes a little bit differently. <clears throat> you know, Chris, I feel also a lot of what you're talking about is ways of teaching. Um, and that could be done with anything. You know, I'm a, I'm a great one for saying it. Gosh, if in a foundation year you had to d decide between teaching drawing or teaching 3D software modeling or something, I'd go with the drawing. You know, there's no problem because it's just you, the artist or creative, and the tip of that pencil, and you learn something about yourself. Uh, you're not fighting against all this other stuff going in and around it. Um, you know, and I think that's a little what you're saying there is that you take a material, you can destroy it, and, and uh, uh, you're educating yourself in all of that. And, and ultimately, whether you're doing that in virtual reality or in physical space is, is neither here nor there, as long as you're extending the thought processes of that individual. That's teaching, yeah. Mm. Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, I had a question for you. Uh, kind of indistinct, but to talk about speed, in my experience with uh, 3D design, one of the problems of it is that it's almost too fast, that you don't have the same time to work through an idea as you are designing it, as you're making it, and there's some risks there with uh, what that means for the thinking process and the making process. Do you want to jump on that? Yeah, uh, a, f a fair comment, and uh, you know, I, th I think that just comes down to kind of self-discipline and reflection. Um, that, uh, yeah, you can sort of knock, knock it out and, and actually not stop and think. Uh, there's also that situation of what you see on screen is very different to what you get out as, f as physical object. Um, so at one level, yes, it is speedy, but it's only finally once it's gone through all the processes, you know, and out of the kiln, can you stop and reflect on that object really? So, you know, m it depends what time scale you're talking about there, I think. Um, you know, and I, an advantage, nice thing, about working obviously on, on, on screen is that it's that much easier to iterate as well. You know, you can save and do another version very easily, whereas I think that if you've got your physical object already sitting there, oh, yeah, it's nearly successful. Am I going to cut it in half and recompose it or not, you know? Um, but in this case, you can do all of that and 
then print out your two versions and make decisions between your two versions. So I, I, I think you know, it's the, the approach that you take that you just need to work out there. I would just add quickly that um, I do think this comes again to um, some of the, the ways that design softwares are, are developed and marketed. And it, it certainly makes sense in a pragmatic way that uh, industry would look to a software tool as a way of speeding things up. And you speed things up and you save some, save some money, right? But of course, that's much less of a concern for many of us. And so one of the things I admire most about the way that Jonathan is working is that you have really developed your own way of uh, developing code uh, that kind of circumvents a great deal of, or all of the design software. And I would guess is not particularly speedy as you're not a, someone who grew right. up coding. Uh, and so when he mentioned self-discipline in a way, I mean, I think it's also comes down to teaching. Uh, that we don't necessarily accept that, yes, this is the indus industry standard tool for designing, and so therefore we're going to all use that. But if that standard tool had a very clear set of uh, outcomes in mind, then that really short circuits the process that we all uh, love. So it's very difficult because we're not in a position to create our own software packages from scratch. Um, but you can seek things out. And one of the things, again, that I think is wonderful about uh, Jonathan's approach is will, being willing to sacrifice, uh, let's say, having the most expansive and most new tool set in order to have a great deal of control over speed, over form, over content. Uh, and so you say, you know what, maybe I only need a few tools. Maybe I don't actually need, you know, everything that's out there. Maybe I don't need the most powerful computer uh, to work on this stuff. Maybe one of my constraints is going to be that I need to work on this laptop that I've had for some time and I'm not willing to uh, you know, take out another loan to get uh, some sort of super, supercomputer uh, to run these things. Yeah, just continuing on that point, I have to say all my work is self-financed. I, I have no grants in all of this. I'm self-employed. Uh, you know, that it's possible. I, there was, I walked in yesterday at the end of a talk and there was a question of you know, how do you implement how do you finance this implemented in a school and so on and so forth? I, I'm not saying it's easy at all, but I, you know, accessibility and sustainability is an absolute mantra for me. I don't like the idea of often courses where there's a research that is in you know using really high tech stuff and then can't be continued out the other side. That it, you know the the outcome of that research just gets Im uh, kind of I embedded. Um, I think an another thing that does irk me a little is that most of the kit that we use it obviously comes out of engineering. Uh, and so there's engineering speak a lot of the time, and I try not to use, you know, what SLS is and, and kind of all of that stuff. I just don't know it. Um, uh, and Tom picks me up on this periodically, and I just say, no, just use kind of slip terms and all that kind of thing. Um, so try and burst that battle, bubble. Uh, and then also, as you were saying, you know, the software is being developed towards the ease of use for um, engineering and um, you know I use the blender software that is for animation uh, and the, the mindset between those you know something like again people who know the area um, uh, fusion 360 is very much engineering blender is much softer and then it has sculpting tools to it and that you know and so what tool set you use actually can influence a, a lot you know how you work Inevitably. Any other questions? Okay, uh, we're at the end of the hour, uh, so I'm getting a signal to uh, to stop. Uh, if anybody has additional questions, I, I, I don't want to speak for Jonathan, uh, but I assume uh, we would both be happy to take any additional questions uh, folks may have. Thank you, everybody, so much for attending. Thank you.